The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Australian Retirement Trust, ABN 60905 115 063, AFSL number 228975 and is limited to publicly available information. General advice may be provided by our sponsor, but does not take into account your objectives, financial situation, or needs. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This series is brought to you by Australian Retirement Trust, a fund that's trusted by over 4,000 advisors and more than 2 million members. With over $200 billion in retirement savings, they have the size and scale to seek out world-class investment opportunities that others may miss and are committed to working with advisors to help your clients live the retirement they want. Visit australianretirementtrust.com.au forward slash advisor. Include super savings and Q Super FUM and members at June 2022. Hello and welcome back to the series on the art of building trusted relationships. Now, trust is an unconscious feeling which is felt by somebody and building trust is complicated. And as we look at the research in this final episode of our series, we hear from our speakers about the feeling of somebody acting in your best interest. Let's get into the conversation. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us on this, the fourth episode and fourth and final episode of our series. Uh, we're talking about the concept of uh, the feeling that you get when somebody is generally acting in your best interest. Now, this is a really interesting part of Trust Fraser, and it's probably the most important part of it. It's the idea that um, that you are aligned with someone, that someone who you are working with is absolutely part of your tribe and absolutely representing you and working for it. In the trust research, the, particularly the stuff which has come out of Michigan by David McNeil Whistler, it's referred to as benevolence, and it doesn't mean giving, it means aligned beliefs. Um, so the, the concept of having aligned beliefs is really important, and one of the things that we're always looking for when we're looking for people to provide services for us is the, the idea that they're going to be working with us in our best interest. And this is, I think, true of every service provider. It's why we have, I have a favorite dentist, I have a favorite doctor, and I have a favorite financial advisor because I've known them for a long time. So repeated behavior and reliability is really important in that construct. And we've talked about that before, but knowing what they're going to do and how they're going to act under pressure also becomes really interesting. The idea that you're paying someone to expend energy to transform you and your life means that they absolutely have to be treating you individually and acting in your best interest. The moment that you get a sniff of the idea that you're just part of a cohort or you're part of a group or that the person isn't caring about you, then your behavior starts to change. Now, this is really important to financial services because two really, really critical drivers in this. One's demographic and one's economic. So the demographic one is that we're getting the fastest growing group of old people that we've ever had in the world. Um, the, uh, so the number of people turning 57, which is the most common age of retirement in Australia, is rapidly rising. And so as you approach that 57-year anniversary, you start to pay attention to your money for the first time for a long time. The data says that about five years out, you start paying attention to it. And then five years after you reply, you pay a lot of attention to it. So that you get a decade of people paying a lot of attention to the money. Prior to that, you don't care because you're in your accumulation. And after that, you don't care because you're used to living on what you're used to living in. So the act of accumulating is relatively homogenous, which means it looks the same. So you're focused on price, you're focused on record keeping, a little bit on service. But as soon as you start to decumulate, it's really personal, it's heterogeneous. And that's the time that service and intimacy become really important being able to articulate really clearly to your planner what you want, to, for your planner to be able to reflect that back to you and constantly come back to you and say, when you came and spoke to me, you said you wanted or said you were trying to achieve and this is what I've done to deliver on those kind of things and being able to stay in touch with you on that basis. The data on this is pretty clear. You've got to make that conversation and anchor on that conversation about every 90 days and keep reflecting back to people that you've listened to them and that you're delivering against their needs. Now, 
understanding that people's needs will change, understanding that when you first get to know people, they mightn't be as honest about their needs as they might necessarily want to be, and understanding that if you're working with a couple, those needs mightn't be aligned. Um, those, those things become really important to understand, but that's really critical. So one of the big groups of um, things that you might be doing when you're first starting building relationships with people is starting to really understand what their drivers are, what motivates them, really understand what their uh, what their intentions are, and then reflecting that back to them. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to believe in the same things as them. They might be saying, I want to give all my money to the people's front of Judea and you might think that's insane but that's their need right so you need to be able to reflect that and and deliver against it and and make sure that the people understand that you that you're involved in it and making sure that that's happening making sure that you can constantly anchor that not say to them why are you doing that you're an idiot that's the bad thing and making sure that people sort of can see evidence of the behavior that you're giving them that, that, that you're aligned yeah this is a really important thing that you know I've, I've heard people say all the time people don't want to be heard you know and you want to demonstrate that you're listening and you you can hear what they're saying and then we overlay there's a lot of technology out there these days that have gone from the the fact find meeting of really sitting down and listening and asking a few questions and just going deeper and deeper to online fact find you know put your details and information in here uh, how do you see that change as you know, well, with you know, going more online and digital for fact find versus um, you know spending more time in the space of, of really just sitting down and just having conversations about. So know. there's a couple of core themes on this, and I don't want to get too oogity boogity about this, but the digital systems of understanding what people are actually doing are getting better and better and better. And I know that you're into this, and you understand that the um, the new computer aided systems which are coming out of the US and interestingly China are actually getting better at, at picking up on stated beliefs versus revealed behaviors and understanding what's going on there. So I think there's a bit of that's going to happen in the future. I think that the advisors will get better and be- better training on actually asking the questions and understanding what's going on. And I think that people who had come to advice from a technical background and want to work in a technical background will either pass off that role to somebody else so that they get to do it. And I think that we're really good at start putting those people and their beliefs into cohorts so that we can satisfy, satisfy them en masse. Remember we talked to before about Dunbar's number, the, the net number of relationships that anyone could hold one time is 150. Well, in the last 12 months, the number of clients that a good advisor has got, it's gone from about 124 to about 152. So at the moment, advice is full. If we're going to achieve scale in advice, we have to find ways to satisfy people en masse or get a lot of advisors really quickly. So one of the ways that we need to be able to do that is to be able to actually have benevolence out on mass. And the only way we can do that is understand people's drivers on mass. Getting scale on that hasn't yet been satisfied. We're still doing that individually and hand to hand. But I think that there are systems and processes coming down the pipeline that are, that are going to work in that space. And my expectation is that the platforms will be the big players in, in that space if they're not already starting to think about it. So in order to do that, um, in my immediate my immediate idea goes straight to if you're looking for drivers on mass, you then work out the drivers and you put people into categories and you say, hey, all you people are, you know, Collingwood supporters, if you want to use that analogy we used earlier, uh, or whatever it might be, and then using uh, or, or all of you people, or all of you are like this, you've told us you're like that, and then being able to do it that way? Is that yeah, thing? so you wouldn't ever tell them that because people will reflect it and they hate the idea of being co- uh, being stuck into cohorts. Um, but the, the way in which you would do it is simply understand the drivers that satisfy those cohorts and start to reflect that in your communication. And there are already systems that are that are actually doing uh, are doing that quite uh, quite effectively, and the governments are actually doing it. And if you want to look at that, you can have a look at the Nudge Unit in the UK and the Nudge Unit, which is in Canberra, who are operating that space. The Nordics also also are very good at the Nudge Units. One of the ways of thinking about this is uh, there's a bunch of presentations that you'll see, which is about intergenerational, Generation X, Gen Y, Gen Z, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's a poor explanation of the way in which people behave. The, possibly a better way or a richer way is uh, is breaking people up into behavioral cohorts. Um, uh, the, the, you can make that as fine or as gross as that you want to. The post-Jungian analysis says that there's kind of four big behavioral cohorts. There's people who are controllers, so people who want to control every aspect of their life. There's people who are externalized. There's people who want to display every act of their life. There's people who are coach seekers that, that, that want to actually just seek help all the way through everything. And there's people who are warriors who want to, who want to worry about what's going on. If you can break the, the people up into those kind of, those kind of cohorts, you can start to reflect what's going on. Controllers tend to want to manage things themselves. So they want digital access and they, do, they want to be able to do it and they want to be able to trade and do all those things themselves. Really interesting. Well, they also tend to be wealthier because they benefit from education and doing all those kind of things. So some recent work we've done in the high net worth 
area shows how much they want to have everything to be online and they can do it and they want to be able to trade themselves, which of course is you know difficult, but that's the way it is. Warriors simply want to pass control to somebody else. They don't want to do it. They don't want to engage in it. They're just worried about it. And all they want at the end of the, of the day is to know that they're that it's safe. So if you look at the stack and you, while controllers want the ability to see their information online and play with it, warriors clearly want the ability to, um, to understand that they've got good income security. Yeah, it's interesting. And I love the idea of, um, you know, segmenting those people within your existing client base and be able to send them different copy. Um, you know, if you want control of this, then blah, blah, blah. We've got the thing for you. If you're worried about that, then we've got this, you know, so to be able to look at what the communications that you're sending out on, on a regular basis, because we talked about that. Um, uh, and then be able to control then, uh, what that, what the, what the words are in that email or, or that, the that other text. way to think about it. And this is a really interesting way to think about it is just say, well, who do I work best with? How can I put 150 controllers in my group? Because I work really well with controllers. I work really well with people who want a number in every sentence. I want work with really people well who want a time frame in every sentence. They tend to want less of an emotional relationship with me. They want a fact-based, outcome-based relationship with me. Whereas warriors want to cuddle. Um, so, I mean, they're the, they're the kind of polar opposites in the kind of behavioral scheme. So understanding that who you work well with. Some people are great with warriors. I've got uh, friends who are advisors who are, unbelievably warm and friendly and approachable and have an avuncular relationship with their clients, but also got advisors who are my friends who are, you know, who are just, you know, kind of right brained, hard assed, just, just the numbers and their clients love them for that. So you, you know, trying to satisfy both is hard. If you can only have 152. How many of the 152 can you have that look most like you that you find personally the easiest to satisfy and are wealthiest because that's going to drive the integers for both of you. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. It goes back to what your authenticity is and what how you want to be, uh, how you want to behave, and and because uh, the idea is that you're going to behave that way for a long period of time. Yeah, and you also find it easier. Fantastic. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for being part of the series. I really appreciate your insights and uh, and your references and, and your research and all the other people, the humans that have come before you and done this research that you just happen to know know all that information. So it's been fantastic to have you along. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. I'm always interested in this idea because, I mean, I think our industry is really important. The better we get at it, the more people we can help. So yeah. thank you. Fantastic. And if somebody wants to continue a conversation with you, what's the best way for them to get hold of you? Just email me. I'm andrew at cordata.com.au and I, and I tend to respond and I'll try and be as reliable and as authentic as possible in my responses. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jane, thank you for joining us again. And this is the final episode of our podcast series, The Art of Trust. Uh, in this episode, we are talking about um, the feeling that people get when somebody else is acting in their best interest. Uh, welcome to the conversation. Hi, Fraser. Thank you for having me. Fantastic to have you along. Now, um, let's uh, let's dive in here. Tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are around what you know what that feeling is and and how that comes about. Well, firstly, it's the right thing to do. So, people that are not acting in someone's best interests always surprises me. Look, again, a part of that conversation piece with clients is explaining to them if you are in this current position and. After some conversations and some research, I come back to you and my recommendation is that the pathway is moving forward, but we're potentially going to to move off a little bit uh, for different reasons. It might be a a replacement of product or a a change of insurance or um, changes to their uh, their contributions to to superannuation, for example. It's explaining... um, if they want to get into the technicalities of it, the deep-seated technicalities. But it's explaining about, here's the reason why I've recommended it. Here's the benefits. So we're always talking about advantages and implications because that's very important. The transparency around that is important. But this helps to get you, you know, let's go back to what those original goals and objectives were. And uh, and if it's been over a period of time that um, – the strategy has changed and we're still linking it back to those goals and objectives and perhaps over time the goals and objectives themselves are starting to to move a little bit. This is why this is the best option for you. And I've considered these and these this is the reason why that doesn't work. So it is about really laying laying it out and you know I talk to to people about I call it the salad bar of advice. And I say, you may have come to me because, uh, you know, you work talking to someone about superannuation and they're all talking about 
how a certain fund has performed or how this has happened or why that's happened or they've seen something on the TV. And it's about explaining all of that information, so answering, you know, those initial inquiries, but it's about ensuring that they're on their pathway and then on, on the pathway of somebody else because I, as you know, we spoke about before where I encourage people to to tap into to my knowledge. You know, if they're going to send me a text at 10 o'clock at night because they heard something or they read something, that's fine. And I'll explain what that is and that's, you know, this is not in your strategy and, and this is the reason why. Um, or it actually is in your strategy, but we're calling it this. Remember this? This is what we spoke about. So, I have to arm them with all of the information and that is acting in their best interest is them walking away saying, firstly, I am I have trust in Jane or I feel that I can start to invest some of my trust in Jane. So it is them feeling vulnerable about the trust space. But it's also about them saying, I feel I'm in control of this. It's not Jane being in control. She's putting me in control and we're going down the pathway together. Yeah, wow, so so much in that. I really love, I really love the fact that um, w- when you start talking about that, you have this this belief in your voice, as in you, you know, you you know, undoubtedly what it is that you're talking about when it comes to the, um, you know, the the advice or the product or the conversation or the salad bar, um, and just being able to, and I love the salad bar analogy too, by the way, uh, but just I think I feel like some of that all of that stuff that you just said comes through in your mannerisms and your tone and the belief that you have in what you're saying? Yeah, look, I, you know, it's it, it's important that um, because people think they, you know, they're coming to you for this, they have an objective. But I always explain that I have these little light bulbs going off in my head while we're having those conversations around, oh, so you came to me about that, but you just mentioned this, so I'm just going to park that. And so that's why I say we're going to talk about the salad bar of advice because you might have come to me about superannuation, but maybe we're also going to be talking about some legacy planning because you're going to send your kids away to school or there is an expense for braces or, you you know, you want to help the kids out with cars or you want to go on a holiday when you retire or there's certain things that you want to do. And so I'm I'm going to include all of that in that advice piece and these are the reasons why, because it's in your best interest that you are informed about it. You're well informed about it and you can make some decisions around it. Jane, thanks for, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of your thoughts and ideas and, and wisdom with us all. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, if somebody wants to continue the conversation with you, what's the best way for somebody to reach out? Well, uh, they can they can contact me through uh, my website, um, Foxwealth Advisory. .com.au. I'm on LinkedIn. I have a Facebook page for Foxwealth Advisory. I have an Instagram page for Foxwealth Advisory. So yes, I welcome anyone to continue the conversation. Wonderful. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Fraser. Welcome back, Anthony. Thanks. Uh, now we are talking about the concept of uh, the feeling clients get, uh, sometimes conscious, sometimes uh, unconscious of that as somebody is, has got their back, they're acting in their best interest. And uh, we, you know, we, we, we have this concept of best interest that we've had for a long period of time. But tell me a little bit about how you uh, talk to your clients about that or how you behave in that way to, to demonstrate to clients that uh, you've got their back. I guess it's really interesting that, you know, when all this sort of best interest duty things came out because I guess my philosophy always was, well, well, isn't that what we've always been doing? Like, isn't that what we do? That's our job. Uh, and look, I know there's always been some people that may or may not, but I think that happens everywhere. So it's not, not endemic just in our industry. But I think, again, just some of the things we've talked about previously about just going through things like a process, explaining to people what to expect, how we're going to operate, um, et cetera. I think that that starts that demonstration process and then it's up to us to then, I guess, deliver that value and explain that value that we're adding to the client so that they feel that, in fact, we are acting in their best interest and that, you know, has been well worthwhile them, them coming in as far as that's concerned. I think in the last episode I talked about just ringing clients at random out of the blue. Don't wait for your, oh, well, today's it's no, 1st of November time for their review. Um, things happen, you know, during the year. Things happen all the time. I mean, a good example at the moment, I've got a client who's quite unwell. I, I probably ring him every couple of weeks just because I want to see how he's going, you know, and he greatly appreciates doing that. And, um, of course, yeah, I don't have to, and, you know, his review is not due until whenever it might be. But 
Um, I think, you know, that then sort of permeates and through, you know, people, their friends, um, other contacts they've got because I know that, you know, I know unfortunately it turned out to a funeral one time and a lot of people come up to me and said, oh, I really appreciate the time that you spent with, you know, uh, such and such before they passed away and we sort of did that, um, do everything we possibly can. So, you know, I think that those sorts of things really demonstrate both to the client and also to, to others that, you know, you are caring for the client. They're not just a number and a, an ongoing fee type arrangement and um, that we are there to sort of help them as best we can. Yeah. Now, uh, also, um, uh, there's you mentioned in one of the earlier episodes the concept of, you know, um, best interest as in, um, you know, we don't charge a fee if we can't show mm. additional value. I kind of think about this in two ways. You know, people are in a better position by mentally – as well, you know, like or confidence wise, um, or relationship, you know, they've got they feel like they've got something because someone's got their back. That puts them in a better position. But then you've also got the financial side. So there's like two sides to that conversation. Yeah, absolutely there is. And I think yeah, the financial side is fairly quantifiable from an objective point of view. Um then on the other side, I guess it yeah, that becomes very subjective as to um what is required as far as that's concerned. Um I think often, you know, sort of people say that, um, you know, and you sort of read a lot of press, you know, markets have sort of come down. So, you know, people appreciate you, you know, being there and having their back, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's interesting that if, you know, we get very few phone calls during these sorts of periods and I, and I sort of put it down to, you know, we've tried to prepare clients as best we can for that potential eventuality without saying, hey, you know, this will happen. Um, so I often sort of challenge ourselves saying, well, you know, do we really need to be there for them? Um, you know, is it just the fact that they know that we're there for them as important as actually doing something at the time? And, and I think that's – it's probably a really interesting sort of, you know, research someone could actually do on that because I, I think, um, you know, we all assume it. Yes, it is great. You know, we sort of tell clients don't sell out or don't do this and don't do that. Um but if we sort of looked at it, it would only be a small handful of clients would actually ever ring and we'd talk to them at that particular time. Um, but that may well be, you know, just something, sending something out might be, you know, at least they know, hey, I've heard from you. I know that you're looking out for me. But we also give clients that expectation that, look, we don't control markets and we can only manage their risk. We can't really control, you know, outcomes as far as that's concerned. We've just got to make sure that they're comfortable with with those outcomes and and the way they're positioned for what their objectives are into the future. Yeah, I like the word um, comfortable. I think, you know, making clients comfortable is a very, very important part Mm -hmm. of it. And obviously, especially when markets are are doing weird things going up quickly or down quickly. Um, Now, you mentioned the concept of, you know, a couple of times hearing from them, hearing from you, hearing your voice. Uh, You you and I have spoken previously about the concept of, you know, email versus conversations um, where they do get to hear your voice, say, over the phone. Tell us a little bit about how important phone calls are to you over emails. Oh, look, I think, you know, if we if we could if you had to choose one over the other, you'd get rid of emails tomorrow. Um, I think they're a convenient excuse a lot of times to have communicated or hey, I've contacted the client or, or whatever the case might be. But I mean, we've had clients that have been with us for forty years, and you know, well before emails and and well after. Um, and you know, we still spend a lot of time. You know, I'd spend the, the bulk of my time. I try and eliminate as much as possible. And just emailing, unless it's going to be something that's fairly sort of simple. Um, or if I get an email, I'll often even call and say, "Look, I can put this in an email, and I'm happy to." But it's probably quicker for me to explain to you, you know, the answer to your question. Um, and it's just a great, you know, great. You, you don't find anything out on email, whereas you just having a general conversation, how you're going, or how was the fishing trip, or how was a holiday, or how was this, how was that. Um, it also sort of does. It gives you that great opportunity to demonstrate that you do care. I think, you know, most advisors do genuinely care about their clients. Um, sometimes um, maybe it's sort of expected, but um, I think just to be able to sort of, if you've got that opportunity to talk to someone um, and outside that, as I said, um, I think previously, just outside that normal review schedule, just ringing someone and seeing if everything's okay is all it needs sometimes. And it can only be, you know, it's only a few minutes. Clients don't want to spend, you know, hours on the phone with you. You're not necessarily their best friends. Um but just sort of seeing that they sort of think, oh, you're still there for me and, um, you know, because it's like anything out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, really interesting. I think also, I um, mean, you know, it's, it's good to be able to, to communicate 
via voice to somebody, but also to listen uh, and for them to feel like they've been listened to. Yeah, absolutely. And because uh, often, you know, you, I know myself, you know, the way you write emails can sometimes be very structured and very formal. Um, but, you know, you, you, when you're sort of talking to someone, you could throw a joke in there or you can make sort of, you know, lighthearted sort of things about it. And, and sometimes you can communicate that in a language to the client that's a lot, lot better or specific to them rather than just a sort of formal email. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Use your voice. Um, and I really love the concept of, you know, uh, you know, just focusing on that concept of demonstrating that you care about them and, and, and making sure that they can get that through whatever means or conversation is. Yeah, I mean, that's what our job is, I think. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the number of strategies we can put in place for the average client, you can virtually put on one hand. It's not a lot. And I don't think once you sort of have that knowledge of, you know, um, strategies and those sorts of things. I don't think it's overly difficult. I think the challenge is making sure that you're able to communicate that in a very simple way to clients because that's what they're there for. They don't understand all the laws and those sorts of things. Um, we need to do it simply, but we need also to do it in a way that really you know meets what they want to achieve rather than saying, well, well, because sometimes you can optimise something to the nth degree mathematically, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing you know, for that particular client. And and until you spend a bit of time and you understand them and those sorts of things, um, and it's going the extra mile sometimes. I mean, I got called out to a client a few months ago and um, I said, oh, okay, yeah, I'm more than happy to drop out and and see you. And all they wanted me to do was to be able to help them download their COVID certificates because they they couldn't do it. And often I find, particularly with some older clients, they're actually embarrassed sometimes to ask their kids to do certain things. I'm like, I've had to scan medical reports because they didn't want the kids seeing them and send them off to specialists and those sorts of things. And they're the sort of, I guess, the things that you do. And, you know, you sort of start to realise that, you know, people sort of do rely upon you for a whole range of things other than superannuation strategies and retirement strategies. And that's really part and parcel, I guess, of our role. Yeah, I think it's interesting that is it, to be able to find those moments where you can go the extra mile and just keep an eye out for them. Yeah, and look, there's there's always an opportunity. I, I never forget that several years ago, um, a client, she'd broken a leg and she had to get some documents to tax accountant by four o'clock that afternoon for a lodgement and, and she was panicking because she couldn't, you know, she, she didn't know, and I just said, that's fine, I'll just drop around and pick them up and drop them into the city for you because it was 10 minutes out of, you know, out, of my, out of my time. And she couldn't believe that you'd go and do something. And I said, well, I said, no, we're the full, ser- we're the full service advisors right here. So, um, but, you know, that's sort of, it's, it's probably almost building up some of those little brownie points in a way, you know, I, yes, it does demonstrate, but it also means that, you know, we are going to make mistakes down the track or things aren't going to work exactly the way you want. And I think that's another thing too, is that when things don't work out, I think you've got to get onto it. You've got to be very upfront with people. Um, because as we always said, bad news never gets better with age. Um, and I think it's actually a great opportunity to demonstrate that you are looking out for people. Um, I don't think anyone expects anyone to be perfect and often, you know, sort of sweep it under the rug and hope it all never gets found. But, um, you know, sometimes being very upfront and going through that process can actually add a lot of value. Yeah, absolutely. Because let's face it, not everything's a, 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 an easy conversation and not everything just goes smoothly. So it's about leaning into those, leaning into those moments. Indeed. Anthony, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us uh, on this podcast series. If people want to continue the conversation with you, what's the best way for them to get hold of you? Um, well, I am on LinkedIn. Uh, not, a, not a massive user, but definitely uh, am, on, am on LinkedIn. Um, and our um, website's um, www.templetons.com.au. Fantastic. Really appreciate your time. Excellent. Thanks. Great. Thank you for joining me again, Anne. Hello, Fraser. Well, welcome back. We are talking about the clients, the feeling that clients get when they know that somebody's acting in their best interest. Thank you for being part of this conversation. What are your thoughts around the concept of how do advisors get to that point? I think the if the advisor is able to play back, do that reflective listening where they where they can show through their words and then their deeds that they know the client's heart and their what they're worried, like if they can say, you know, I know you're worried about, you know, this, this and this happening and that you are worrying about how much longer you have to work for and how, what you're going to do about your rental property or how you cash, if they can actually replay back to the client the stuff that they're actually, 
the worries that have brought them there? Because ultimately someone's going to a financial advisor because they're worried they're going to make a poor decision about they don't know what to do. So to, to play that back will give the client, in my experience anyway, the highest degree of comfort that the advice they're being given is actually going to be really good in their best interest. It's going to work and take that worry away. Yeah, so it really it really leans into the concept of listening to what the client said, understanding what they've said, um, thinking about it, playing it back to themselves, taking the time, I guess, that, that moment of time that to just quickly jump in and say, oh, I've got the answer for that, to be actually taking the time to try that on themselves. Yeah, I think that's – you've nailed it in one, that active listening. Uh, we all – you know, you and I have spoken in the past um, over many years about phenology, that sort of science of actually understanding people's emotional relationship with money and, you know, different cultures have different – beliefs about money and their discomfort or comfort with investments, bricks and mortar, cash, all of these things. And so you and I also both know there's only a set number of strategies that advisors use in relation to whether it is accumulating into retirement, retirement, you know, there's a set number of strategies. The power is uh, is actually the advisor embedding the, that person's personality and emotional relationship with money and demonstrating they know how they feel about it, what they're worried about. That's the game, to the game changer in my mind. Yeah, and you mentioned the, you mentioned the word concerns and fears in the client's, um, you know, in the, inside the client's head there. What, what, what are some of the ways that advisors can really get to understand the clients? And, uh, and I know you and I have spoken about, um, you know, horror stories where, you know, client, where advisors haven't really thought about you know what's in, what's what the fear is going on inside the client's head. They, yeah, and then ultimately they'll um, they end up with a complaint in my in my you know if, and in these in these days and times where the access to information, financial information, the internet, it's you know so easy for people to get online and research. And we have had members call where they go and see a financial advisor, and they get the SOA, and they go, mm, you know, they go and research this super fun and that super fun investment performance and if they don't like the look of it they'll do nothing which is a it's a lost opportunity because I know you know uh, the data shows certainly here at Australian Retirement Trust the advice the members who are getting fr- regular advice they're in an ongoing relationship because they trust that relationship they're the ones that are making better decisions so I, I think ultimately advisors need to be thinking about really that that risk profiling the members level of comfort or clients level of comfort with taking risk and change and investments financial literacy these are the things where the advisor can win or lose trust in a heartbeat yeah and you mentioned um, that, that the concept of change being a, a, a factor and, and we sort of covered off on some of the previous episodes you told a story um, you told me a story a while ago about some members that have called up do you want to re- go through those yeah just well uh, members where they've um, where a lot members do um, through our research trusting that their super fund is a is a big deal um, it's you know, I think 65 percent see that as one of the most important that their money is safe with their super fund and because uh, again, just in my experience, there's 2 million members here. Financial literacy is poor, Fraser. It's really poor. And so therefore, if they've got their super fund, they've had it for years, that people don't like change. They're quite risk averse. And uh, so they get worried when things, and then they'll call us and say, oh, this advisor's recommending I do this. I don't understand it. What's a managed account? I don't understand. Like, And so and I just think, oh, that's a real shame because to mine – I love seeing advise, seeing external advisors work and advise our members. It's because, um, as I said, they're better off off the back of it. They're much better prepared for retirement than those that aren't. Uh, and but what happens is the members instantly lost trust, in my opinion, in the advice profession. When that happens, they're very unlikely to go and put their toe in the water again for some more advice. So guess what they do? They do nothing. Yep. Yeah. And and then you've got one one more Australian who is not as prepared as they should be for retirement, and that makes me sad. Yeah, we all know that financial advice is worth nothing if you don't actually implement it. Exactly, and that's if they and that's that's you know that's not uncommon. Yep, yep. Uh, t- tell me about um, from the, your brand's point of view and and the work that you've done with the advisors um, and working in the best interest of advisors, because I mean I know that there's been a, a long history that you've done work with financial advisors yeah. and um, you know with working with those advisors to to help those advisors in their practices. Yeah, well, I think trust. I mean, if we're talking about trust, let's 
be honest, if I think back in 2015, there wasn't a great deal of trust for advisors for Sun Super back in the day or any super fund. I'd like to think we've come a really long way. And ultimately, it goes back to, again, the, the whether it's the advisor, the institution, it's being able to demonstrate you know that that person's worries, woes, challenges. And as a super fund, we've got to be able to demonstrate that we know most small, most advisors are small business people, enormous regulatory burden, crazy regulatory burden. It's, um, it's really hard, uh, and expensive to provide financial advice. So if, if we can't demonstrate that we understand about, understand that, care about that and play it back and show what we're doing to try and improve it, then guess what? The advisor won't trust you know, it won't trust the, us as an institution. So I think it, it's this whole value chain of trust, isn't it? And you've got to show, you've got to be really honest about the stuff that you want to improve on, what you want to do well. But again, playing back what's important to the client um, is is everything. Yep. Yeah. Talk, talk to us a little bit about the philosophy because, um, uh, you know, as, as a, a four-member fund, um, you, the, you've always been able to talk to that as in, you know, the members are the, essentially the shareholders. Yes, they are. And so it does – the members are the – well, members are the, the shareholders of the place. We do everything. Um, and I know that sounds like a cliche thing, but it does prevent – we've spoken about transparency in a previous episode. Um, it does – what it does is you're not having to worry about – you can walk away from those decisions – that might be a bit grey from an intent. Is this the right thing to do? It might be really profitable, but how how does does this pass the nano test? Does this pass the front page of the newspaper test? Does this t- does this feel right, or does it feel like we're profiteering? Or that and that's I guess what's particularly great about it. It also just makes sure we we don't have to sort of second guess who we're making decisions for. Um, where I think it would be hard. I'm, you know, it would be hard. I've worked um, in the retail uh, industry and I used to grapple with it a lot, which is why I guess anyone that knows me knows I'm definitely home working in Profit for Member World because you don't have to think about the, your different masters. You've got one master. It's those people, those 2 million people. And we've every they pay my salary. They pay my team's salary. So we need to really work hard and honour it. Yeah, fantastic. It's, it certainly is. I love that saying, is, is, is it the right thing to do? It's always good to, uh, to ask that. I love that, asking that one of the kids mm. uh, from time to time when they Just want to Just because you can do it doesn't mean decisions. you should do it. Exactly right. And this is something you're proud of. Yes, exactly right. Uh, uh, very good. Now, and if somebody wants to reach out to uh, to any one of your team, what's probably what's the best way to do I'd say just jump you? onto the art website, Australian Retirement Trust, art.com.au. There's a whole advisor section in there. The team's photos are there, all their contact details. It's probably the easiest. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming along and joining me in this conversation. Thank you for having me, Fraser. 